Hi, I'm Nora O'Donnell, and this is Person to Person. Our guest today is Oprah. Hello, everybody. Oprah Winfrey is a powerhouse and media icon, hosting The Oprah Winfrey Show for 25 years and interviewing more than 37,000 people during the show's run. She is one of the most influential and famous people in the world. Oprah retired from her daily TV show in 2011, launching her media empire, which now includes the Oprah Winfrey Network, O Magazine, Oprah's Book Club, and lifestyle website, Oprah Daily. She's also an author. Oprah has written over a dozen books about self-care and healing. Now she's coming out with a new book with Harvard professor Arthur Brooks called Build the Life You Want, The Art and Science of Getting Happier. So we visited Central Park. Those are the things that make you the happiest. They make me the happiest, bread and trees. In a cafe in New York City for an intimate person-to-person -person conversation about the road to happiness. So good to see you. So good to see you. I was a philosophy major, and Aristotle, of course, talks about the power of reflection. So to mm -hmm. hear you reflect about everything you learned on the show, and as you write in the book, the Oprah Winfrey show was a front row seat mm -hmm. to unhappiness. Yes, 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 yes. You know, I learned it was my greatest classroom. I've never had a therapist, but I had so many therapists on the show. I got my therapy from the Oprah show. And I learned so much. So when I first started having conversations with families from, you know, different walks of life, that's when I came to understand that there is a common bond that we all share, that we're all really seeking the same things. And knowing that that thing was happiness came from the show. And every day I would sit and talk with the audience for a half hour, sometimes 40 minutes, a producer would be like, oh my God, when is she gonna let go of the audience? What I really want is to have a conversation with the audience to see why did you come and what did you get from the show and did you benefit at all and why do you watch, all of that. So 10 years in, the audience became my focus group. I would always ask people, what do you want? What would it take to make you happy? And most people, when I'd say, what do you want? They'd just say, I just want to be happy. Tell me what that looks like. And as the years progressed, women were more able to identify what that specifically was. But when I first started asking that question in the mid-90s, they would always just say, well, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. Well, what does that look like? And define it. Define, define it. happiness. Define it. And, and what I realize is that most people have never defined it. And then they'd say, well, I want my kids to be happy. Well, that's your kids, but what do you want? And so being able to answer specifically what that looks like for you is the beginning of being happier. You know, I used to always think that I would be happy going to Broadway because I thought that's just a natural progression. You gotta, you gotta do Broadway. Mm -hmm. When the show ended, I was, I was like, gotta do Broadway, gotta do Broadway. Mm -hmm. And I remember the Tony Kushner mm -hmm. sent me a play. I've never shared this story. And after a while, I started to realize I really don't know how I'm gonna do this play every night for eight shows a week. I don't know how I'm gonna do that. And I don't even love the play as much as I love the idea that it was Tony Kushner mm -hmm. and the idea of being on Broadway. So I then really started to examine for myself, what would that look like for me being in New York? Where would I walk my dogs? Where would I live? Where would I go to the grocery store? If I can't be surrounded by the park, how am I going to really exist? Mm -hmm. Just getting around the city mm -hmm. was was always overwhelming for me. Yeah. So I made a conscious choice for my happiness early in my career that New York would not be the place that I would seek. My dream was Chicago. And so the very idea of being in a place where I felt like I could, I could take roots was, was, was what I was looking for to make myself feel 
secure, solid, confident. So on that, in terms of what you said, the defining happiness, mm -hmm. because that's part of, I feel like, what this book does in the beginning is exactly what you just said. It said, happiness is not, I want to be happy. Mm -hmm. You got to, what is it? Yeah, what does happiness? it look what, like for yeah. you? So what, how do you define mm. happiness? Well, you call it happierness. Yeah, I call it happierness <laughs> because as Arthur explains in the book, none of us can be happy all the time. But I will say that I have reached a level of enjoyment, contentment, satisfaction, and purpose that I'm pretty much happy all the time, even though I have negative feelings. And one of the things I think that he expresses so well in this book is being able to identify your negative feeling versus believing that that is a constant state of mind for you or happiness or unhappiness. So the fact that I have a bad emotion or bad feelings but can absorb those feelings and then change them. You wrote in the book that the heart of the Oprah Winfrey show was that it was the classroom. Mm, yeah. And I think the heart of me is really a teacher. One of the big lessons I learned from the show was this, that after every conversation, no matter who it was, in one form or another, that person would say, how was that? Was that okay? Mm -hmm. That happened the first time Beyonce taught me to twerk. Yes. At the end of it, she handed me the mic and she goes, was that okay? <laughs> I went, you're Beyonce, it's very much okay. <laughs> I learned to twerk. And then it happened when I was interviewing a father who had um, abused his children. At the end of it, he goes, was that all right? Mm -hmm. Obama's like, it's good, it's good. Yeah. And so what I started to see was that there, there was this thread that connected um, all of the conversations and that what people were really saying, they were looking for a validation, like, was that all right? Did you hear me? And did what I say matter? And I just could, I could tell you at, after every interview, I'm sure it happens to you in one form or another, a person, the yeah. people are looking to say, was that okay? Why do you think we're in a happiness slump in America? Ooh, I will tell you, one of the most profound reasons, I think, is because everybody is looking at other people's social media, what they believe to be other people's lives, which is only a snapshot of other people's lives and feeling envy about that. And one of the things that Arthur and I talk about in this book is that envy is the great destroyer. The happiness killer. It is the happiness killer. And so anytime you're, anytime you're looking at anything else with envy, you have already killed your own happiness or your ability to be happier in that moment and probably in moments to come. So I, coming from where I've come from, rural Mississippi, never imagining the life that I have, for a long time, I have felt that I had enough, even though I kept getting more. Mm -hmm. But inside myself, I feel that I am enough, which is one of the great lessons. What is at the root of most people's dysfunction is that you don't think that you're good enough. You don't think that you're worthy. You don't own your own essence and your own power. You write, one must recognize that the person in control of your happiness is and forever will yeah. be you. Yeah. I wonder how would you advise, given everything that you've been through in your life and mm -hmm. talked about in your childhood, how does one take agency mm -hmm. over their life and their happiness? Oh, I love this question. Um, I know this, that Many of the things that have happened to you have also happened for you. And that I learned when the crisis or the challenge showed up for me, I immediately would ask, sometimes out loud, but certainly in my own conscious spirit, what is this here to teach me? And how can I get that lesson as soon as possible? And this I guarantee you, the moment you have the conscious realization of, oh, this is why this is here. Showing up to allow me to see whatever that is in your life, mm -hmm. it changes for you. Mm -hmm. Unhappiness is not the enemy. 
No, it is not the enemy. The unhappiness, and if actually one of the things that's so powerful, I think, about uh, what Arthur has written specifically is about how your emotions are there to allow you to feel the feel and then take the wheel of this feeling that I'm having. I'm having this feeling and now I need to do what? And not to allow yourself to be overcome by the feeling. So you have a feeling of anger, you have a feeling of sadness, you have a feeling of disappointment. Doesn't mean you are those things, you are those emotions. And so now what am I gonna do now that I'm feeling disappointed about a certain things? How did you find Arthur Brooks? During the pandemic, I was in search of fuel to keep myself inspired, to keep myself open to possibility, to keep myself hopeful. And I started reading his column in The Atlantic and then looking more and more forward to that column every week on how to build a life. That column was called How to Build a Life. And then I invited him for dinner and he is the perfect person to have for dinner because you just probe his brain yeah. about all the things you've ever wanted to ask about your own emotions and um, searching for happiness and well-being and all of that. So um, I am the kind of person, as you know, that believes that life is better when you share it, whether that's bread or information. And I called him up and I said, what you should do, I think, is take all these columns that you've written and put them in a book because I think people would really benefit from having all of that information in one space. And he said, okay, I think that's a good idea. Where did the idea come to write a book together? Well, he said, why don't we write a book together? And I said, well, you're the one, you're, you're the professor. You're the one who's mastered in it. And he said, well, you've mastered too. You just don't teach it in a classroom. And I thought, well, that is true. And um, so I, I, I agreed to do it for that reason. He said that when you called him, he was incredulous about you know, meeting him, talking really? to him. Really? Yes, he couldn't believe that Oprah That's so was calling still. Arthur Brooks. Yeah, and you know, sometimes that happens when I call up people for book clubs and they'll say, no, no it isn't. I go, yes, it's Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> Oprah calling. <laughs> when we come back, Oprah tells us the ingredients to happiness. So, after all those interviews in many years, mm -hmm. what did you learn from Arthur about mm. happiness? The thing that I learned from him mostly is that we are con in control of our happiness and happierness. You get to decide whether or not you choose to be happier or not, and it's not the circumstances. And why do you call it happierness? Because getting there, it's not a destination, it's a direction. Yeah, or... I love that, and I love that term. Yeah. Because we here in the United States, our Declaration of Independence says we have the pursuit of happiness. We think the pursuit of happiness, we don't think that we're just supposed to pursue it, we think we're supposed to have it. We think we're supposed to have it. It's one of the reasons why I think all of the, you know, Finland and all of those uh, countries, Norway, that get um, high rankings. High rankings. One of the reasons they rank so highly is because their expectation isn't up here. They are content with really a lot less than we are. So there isn't this constant pursuit that you got to be better and better and better and better. They know when they've had enough. And for me, it's understanding that. Um, the pursuit is not out here, but it's here. The pursuit is within. The pursuit is to, first of all, have a great understanding of your own identity and what is required for you to be happy. And to know the difference between your negative feelings and your emotions and your state of being. So my state of being is always a state of satisfaction, enjoyment, and purpose, which is what defines happiness. You need enjoyment, you need satisfaction, and you need purpose. So what author has also taught me is to have more fun. Mm -hmm. 
he, he has taught me to be more open to saying yes to experiences that I normally probably would have not said yes to. And so now you're going to concerts like and Beyonce. I'm Beyonce. Which you don't was, normally do that. I normally don't. You I don't, don't go, go to, to concerts. Big... I don't stay out late. I am the homebody of all time. So I have been more open just to going to different places in the world and hiking, but also just open to, to, to saying yes uh, to life in a way that I had not been before. And I think sort of distilling in so many ways what you've learned all of these years too, and the ingredients too, if you're thinking, how do I get to happiness or happierness? Mm. As you outline in the book, family. Yeah. Friendships. Work. 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 And, and faith. faith. And faith. And faith meaning not religion, because we're not here to tell anybody about any religion you need to be, but you need a faith in something that's more transcendent than yourself. You need, if that's nature, if that's you know a walk in the park, if that's music, if that's art. I don't know how people survive without some kind of spiritual practice or some kind of acknowledgement that you are not the only thing <laughs> that matters in the world, that there is something bigger than you by whatever name you choose to call that, and that there is the mystery of life, and that you lean into that. That's key. You have enormous choice to choose whatever you want to do in terms mm -hmm. of work. So what was your intention in working with Arthur mm. on this book? My intention was to spread the message that you cannot control all of the external circumstances in your life, but you can control how you feel about those circumstances in your life. And once you recognize that you are the, you, it, it, it boils down to the thing that I do when I go to teach in South Africa to my girls. I always teach a class called Life 101. And at the end of that class, I leave them with the poem Invictus, which I learned when I was eight years old. The last lines are, I'm the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. And so what that, taking control of your emotions and not allowing your emotions to control you, taking the will, allows you to be the master of your fate and the captain of your soul, and to do that with greater happierness. I love Invictus, and if I had on short sleeve shirts, you would see my goosebumps. <laughs> really? <laughs> and why did you get goosebumps? I had written that down before many times, but to hear you say it, and also because the stories we learn mm -hmm. as young children, and then the stories we tell ourselves, yes. the songs and lyrics and poems and phrases and quotes that we repeat, what we tell ourselves becomes truth. Yes, yes. It was the very first, like, big person's poem yeah. that I memorized and then grew to understand what that actually means. Mm -hmm. And so being able to be the captain for yourself and master your own fate begins with mastering those emotions. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the most significant things that Arthur has to teach us about being happier. And when we come back, Oprah tells us her first thought every morning. What makes you happy in your daily life? So, 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 so many things. I have trained myself that the first thought is thank you. That is my first thought. And then I move from what do I have to do or what is this day? What day is it? Oh, I'm in New York. I'm talking to Nora later. But my first thought, no matter where I am in the world, is thank you. And that is also my last thought going to bed. Is Oprah ever envious? Mm-mm. 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 It's just not a part of my... Yeah. Ever. I can't. Yeah. I'm happy for other people's happiness. I am particularly happy when other women rise. I mean, when I heard you were going to be doing the evening news, I was so happy for you because I remember 
when Barbara Walters first did that with Harry Reasoner and how horribly she was treated during that time. And at the time, I was being treated horribly too, you know, by, by, by even the local anchor. So for you to be able to sit at the helm in that seat, I, I, I'm nothing but happy for that. Do you remember you called me? You just talked about being someone there in the unique role of being able to travel the world as a woman and tell the most important stories mm. in the world. That and sounds like me. That sounds like yeah. me. I felt proud for you and I felt I understood having seen this from a, you know, another perspective and been much older than you that, wow, that is a really big deal. That is a really big deal. You have the gift of letting people see something that they cannot see themselves. Do I? You do. Okay. I, I accept that. Yeah. Okay. I think that's your gift. I mean, that's what you do with this book. That's what you did for me at that moment. I think that's why Arthur and I are so complimentary to each other, because that's what I've been trying to do my entire career, is help people see the fullness of themselves is holding up a mirror so you can see, even when you're looking at the most dysfunctional people that I'm talking to on the show, you can say, well, I'm not that, and I don't want to be that, and oh, if they were able to triumph over that, I could triumph over that. And so now this opportunity to do this through a book and perhaps maybe a podcast or however we can spread the word that your happiness, your happierness is going to be up to you. And it's up to you to be the master of your fate, the captain of your soul, and most importantly, the master of your happiness. No matter what, I'm going to be okay. And I think that's what this book helps you get to. No matter what, I can be in control of how I choose to react regardless of the circumstance. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nora O'Donnell, and this is Person to Person. Our guest today is Drew Barrymore. <coughs> Drew Barrymore became a household name 40 years ago, starring as Gertie in E.T. Give me a break. I'm so in love with you. And since then, she's been in dozens of movies and TV shows, earning herself a Golden Globe for Best Actress. I'll need a clause in my contract that lets me do roles in other movies and two Emmy nominations. Now she's also an entrepreneur with a number of product lines, a New York Times best-selling author. Please welcome Drew Barrymore. And a talk show host. She just kicked off the third season of The Drew Barrymore Show. And Drew joins us for an intimate person-to-person -person conversation from her dressing room in New York City. Drew Barrymore, welcome to Person to Person. It's so good to see you. Nora, I love getting to see you. Every time we see each other, it's just, you know, a bit of a love fest, and I admire you. I'm with you every night, like everyone else watching you, and I'm just so excited to be here having this conversation. Oh, well, I love talking to you. I love being around you. You are like the sun. You just emanate brightness and warmth in everything you do. That's what I love about watching you is that you dare to put your exclamation mark of your reaction and your feelings on these stories. And it, it's very informative and calming um, to see the humanity in what you do. And then you bring those extraordinary stories, you know, at the end of the show. And I feel like that last quarter is really about like the hope and the functionality and the good people out there we have to have that. I love watching the news. I'm a news junkie, but I also need to know the good because I don't think human beings function really well with just hearing the hard stuff. We've got to have the sugar with the medicine. And for me, that's, you know, not just about a sweetness. It's about the reality that there is such good things happening. I do. I call our show hard news with heart. 
and the heart to me is really important because the news is sometimes difficult, but there are so many examples of people who care deeply about their communities, about their families, and trying to make the world a better place. I know, and just, it's funny how one day you may not know about this particular person, and the next day you do, and your life is forever changed. Like, they've entered your universe and your sphere, and you hold them dearly. And that is such an important thing about human interest, is I am interested in human beings. Whenever I have really difficult moments, I will definitely sort of come to my knees or pray or ask questions to the universe and every time I get an answer it'll always be like we're here to take care of each other or I love people and I'm like those are my answers that is so not dark I'm so relieved <laughs> good okay great I can work with this um, so congratulations on season three of the Drew Barrymore Show. What have you learned and how do you want to use this season? I've learned a lot. Um, coming into the show in September of 2020 was such an unprecedented time to, you know, obviously launch a talk show, but it was just, you know, such a bigger, more important time to focus outward and change the rules a little bit because the world was asking us to think differently. I wanted to make that applicable to the show, but I was nervous. It was a nervous time, even though I've been in this business, so to speak, my whole life. It doesn't mean you're equipped to start a new job and know exactly what to do. There are so many learning curves in a job like this. Um, but I'm such a curious person, as are we all, and boy, does a job like this satiate curiosity. You get to learn about everything all day, <laughs> every day, and that for me is the life I wanted to live. I think I've played characters and I've been a, a part of storytelling my whole life, which was not just satisfactory, it was a dream and a blessing. But I think this chapter right now has been a lot about how do you live a life that isn't just necessarily fiction. I think right now I'm really, I'm a mom and I'm in my mid to late 40s and I, I have a lot of things that are, are a huge priority for me to figure out in my real life. And this job is so perfect for that chapter. It's a dream. What are you trying to figure out? Behavior, how we react, um, what the effects of that reaction can be, how we process things, how we do take care of each other, how we grow up. I don't think growing up is overrated at all. I really like it. <laughs> um, a lot of ways I grew up as an adult. So there are things that I'm learning, you know, like how to raise kids and what boundaries are and those kinds of things were not in my world as a kid. My life was very open. My mom and I, you know, we went out to the clubs. I didn't really go to school. I was paying the rent since I was 11 months old. And so as much as that was so awesome and I would never change a thing, I had a lot of things to figure out that I didn't know. And I love what's happening in the real world. That's why we have this segment called Drew's News because like you, I aim to find those stories out there where you can find out interesting things about people in the world or things that are happening that are really positive and we need that yeah because we're all in a process of kind of learning and discovery but i love that the tagline for it is serving the news sunny side up that's so great and you're going to turn it into a podcast i understand yes and i never expected that this would go in the direction when we shot the pilot for this hopeful would-be show it was in August of 2019. So we did not have a crystal ball. We did not know where the world was going, but I felt like with social media and the sort of 
equalizer of how everybody is able to put themselves out there and how we're able to process our information that we needed to make a different type of show. I also find like sometimes back in the day before social media, it was hard to find the good news stories. Um, they were sort of buried underneath, um, deep in the newspaper or tiny little columns. And I think the way our world works now with social media, with digital, we are learning that people do crave that information and they want it. So we're making it more and more available for them. This is such a relief to me because it shows that people's curiosity are not you know, only in the harsh realities or simply the morbid, it's like, nope, they want good news too. And we need that. Yeah, I know that you highlight that and we certainly do too at the end of our, our broadcast and throughout it too, people, we have a whole series called American Innovation about people who are doing things that are innovative and hopeful, whether it's science or business, whatever it may be. So do you have some, um, some guests that you're looking forward to having this season or the must have guests that you haven't been able to book yet? It's funny that you said innovation and business and science. I, when I'm reading the newspaper, I find the business section to be sometimes extremely optimistic because there's some really good important yeah. information in there that's going to affect and change people's lives for the better. And like, that's the section it's put mm -hmm. in. And so you're so right. News doesn't just have to be about the facts. It, it can be informational and let people know these things are happening. You should know about this. Information is power. So as far as guests, when we first started the show, I told our casting director, I was like, no one's ever coming to this show. No, we don't know what it is. It's a tough time. It's September of 2020. I don't expect anyone to show up. Cut to a few years later, and, um, you know, George Clooney just said yes to coming on the show. Um, you know, we're talking to Katy Perry, who I not only love and admire, but I get to say to her, you know, when I was going through a divorce and a move across the country and trying to change jobs and pick a new career path that would keep me at home more with my kids, we sang Roar and we felt like empowered girls <laughs> rather than, you know, the lost souls that we could have. And I want to make things personal. Idris and his wife, Sabrina, the Elbas, um, I want to ask them, like, how do you navigate having a company together while having a marriage? Like, how do you pick your times in which to choose to talk about work or shut it down? How does that function? And do comedy with them. And um, my ex-boyfriend, uh, Justin Long, is, is coming on, and I love exploring the behavior, again, of how we champion the people of our past, what our relationships become. Um, we're all in a relationship of some sort, a boss, a coworker, a brother, a mother, a lover, we're all trying to figure out how to work and live amongst each other in like vibrant, healthy, humorous ways. I just want to try and speak to as many different types of people. Life is a mood board and I want to really speak to a lot of different curiosities and things that we all have inside of us. We're not just one thing. It's no one's one note. We are so riddled with variety and diversity and we need to know and think and figure out so many things. How do we indulge all of the spices that we all are? <laughs> We're such a strange mosaic human beings. I love that. Life is a mood board. All right, Drew, stand by, because when we come back, we'll talk to Drew about her experience singing in the rain. <laughs> And we're back with Drew Barrymore. One of my favorite videos that you posted this summer was Dancing in the Rain. You were dancing in the rain and you encouraged people to do the same. <laughs> Every time it rained this summer, I thought I need to go out there and post a video, but people will think I'm silly because I'm not Drew Barrymore. But I thought that capturing of just the joy 
of doing something as fun as that. And of course, it, it went viral. Whenever you can go out into the rain, do not miss the opportunity. What was the reaction you got from it? I had no idea that anyone would ever notice it. You know, just didn't really expect anything to ever come out of that video. But every time I do see the rain, I do try to run out in it. And I try to worry about the aftermath afterwards. My hair's gonna be wet and curly. I gotta go back to work. My, how, what am I gonna do with these wet clothes? You know, we can talk ourselves out of things so fast that it stops us from doing them. And there's a great Isaac Dennison quote that says, there's nothing that can't be cured by salt water, sweat, tears in the ocean. <laughs> and I do think of that kind of elemental shift that something like walking out into the rain for a little bit would do to you. It's gonna snap you into a different sphere very quickly. And sometimes we need that shift. That's a part of staying unstuck is not overthinking things and believe me i am oh i'm 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 definitely guilty of overthinking things sometimes but the rain is a good reminder to not do that and just leap before you look that's excellent advice because i think a lot of mothers overthink i know i certainly overthink way too much and i probably need to to let it go. You know, you're entering this third year of your show. Rolling Stone did this great piece on you, just kind of about what you've accomplished. I don't know if you've seen it, but they called you America's sweetheart. Isn't that lovely? That's crazy and so nice. Um, that's nice. That's such a nice term, a sweetheart. Who, who wouldn't want to be that? I feel like I'm a rebellious person. I like the heart. I'm such a work in progress. I think that is a title I feel comfortable giving myself because it is so where I'm at. I'm so eager to do the work. It's so rewarding. And I find that I love seeing results. That to me is the great incentivizer. And when I work really hard on myself, I'm seeing really positive results, time management, calmer reactions, um, different prioritizing, doing things that I would have thought was completely crazy when I was a kid, but now as an adult, I'm like, oh, I guess that's why they do things that way. You're gonna constantly evolve. And that's really good news because that in its nature is gonna prove to you, you don't have to stay stuck. It's incredible all that you're doing when you talk about that. You really are an entrepreneur in so many ways. I mean, I think most of us know you from obviously your movies um, and everything you've done before in acting, but now the show. And then of course, when I walk into CVS, there you are, there's your whole makeup line, your incredible kitchen products, loving that immersion blender. And it looks pretty too. I mean, <gasps> looks great. I mean, how do you manage doing all of that? Not well, um, <laughs> not perfectly. It's, it's looking good uh, to us. It's looking good. <laughs> it's messy, you know? I, in fact, I think part of why I wanted to create this line, Beautiful, was a way for me to have some type of wellness in my head and in my eyes and in my heart. Because when I see messes or cords, or things that are more functional than aesthetic, I'm not sure it always evokes the most positive feelings. So I thought the pandemic was really evidence that we are gonna live in our homes differently. Maybe even moving forward, we're gonna work differently. Things won't go back exactly as they were. The water is out of the bottle. So I realized how much that we need a level of peace that wasn't there before. And could that even come in the form of things that you leave out on your countertop or interact with or are forced to look at every day? How can we start to move forward in like an apple for women kind of way? 
that things are functional and they're attractive and they create some semblance of calm. That for me, I love designing and that became my North Star. I love it. I love it. And when we come back, we'll ask Drew Barrymore about the best advice she's ever gotten. And we're back with Drew Barrymore, as promised. So what's the best advice you've ever gotten? I do work with a therapist and, and whenever I'm working with him or whenever I'm working on myself, I write things down and I write them on cards. And then what I do is I put those cards on the wall. And usually they're somewhat general enough to apply to different situations at different times. I'm trying to keep track of my lessons or my aha moments or my wisdoms or my breakthroughs so that I don't lose sight of them and I can keep turning back to these walls and they don't just fall off into the ether. They're there when I need them. So let me picture, I'm picturing this in my mind. Like, is it in your closet at home? Is it in your bathroom? And are they note cards? And give me an example of what one says. Right out of the gate, you guessed it. It's in a tiny coat closet that I sacrificed for the greater spiritual good. And it's where I keep all the notes. And the wall is filling up, which is good news because that means there's many lessons learned, but I know I can go in there and shut the door and I just, the walls are like here, but I have a 360 where I can look at all the notes and they always help when I need them most. Well, that's, that's the takeaway for me is that I'm gonna start writing things down. I'm gonna get a little, some note cards and post them up about little things to remember because for all of us, as you taught us, life is a work in progress. We're all on a journey. None of us are perfect. As I always say, the quality of your life is built on the quality of your relationships and we can always make relationships better. I love that so much. I've also started keeping a tiny moleskin notebook and I keep a gratitude journal and it's been so effective for me and my kids because we'll spot people and things throughout the day and they'll say, we need to put them in the gratitude journal. And it's shifted our perspective to make sure, like the notes in my little coat closet, that if we are looking out for these things and we document them somehow, they will just lock in and resonate and stay there in a different way because we're being inundated by stuff all day long every day. It's understandable how hard it is to keep track of things. So that little extra effort to keep track of things has been very helpful for me in the last few years. Well, we're almost out of time, but the remarks by my daughter's headmistress was about a podcast that she had heard from a psychiatrist this summer on a long drive about the power of mindset and how you can address stress, anxiety, and everything by changing your mindset. And so what you just said about keeping those notes and the gratitude journal, you're gonna make me cry. So on this note, I love you. I can't wait to see you in person. Thanks for always just inspiring us, making us happy and making us think more deeply about our lives. I love you, Nora, love you. so much. And there's plenty of access to stress. And I thank you for delivering all the news that we need to know and doing it with humanity and heart. And it means so much to people. I tune into you every night. You know, you're my source of finding out everything. And I am calmed by that. I feel safe with you. I feel inspired by you. That is a big deal. And I'm just one of many people that you do that for. So thank you. And thank you for having me on the show. You know I love you. I will, I'm just always happy to be near you. Love you. Good luck. We'll see you soon. Take care. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.